This week on Tales of Tyria, we've got some show updates for you, as well as a couple of great links, and then we're jumping into structured PvP. So sit back, grab a drink, and enjoy the show. Yes, welcome everybody, welcome. This is Tales of Tyria, your Guild Wars 2 podcast. I am Bridger, and welcome to your source for Guild Wars 2 news, insight, and discussion. We are almost live from the mists, ladies and gentlemen, because here today we're talking about structured PvP. Uh, it is great you got a hold of the program, however you may have found it. Tell a friend or two about us, won't you? It's talesoftyria.com. That's where you can find all of the shows. Just a couple of quick updates before we begin. I would like to very quickly remind everybody that uh, feedback at talesoftyria.com is how you can get a hold of us. If you have a question, comment, or you want to uh, propose a subject for next show, feedback at talesoftyria.com is how you can do it. Now, this is very exciting. Coming up on Tuesday, we're going to have our second Team Legacy community event, and uh, this is, this is going to be Civilization V Gods and Kings. This is a, a new initiative by Team Legacy. I guess you can call it part of No Fan Left Behind 3.0. We're trying to get the community around Tales of Tyria and Team Legacy to sort of coalesce into a single organism of awesome, uh, I guess would be the way that you say it. And coming up, uh, like I said, Tuesday, starting at 2 o'clock, we're going to have uh, the civilization with the new expansion, Gods and Kings. We're going to get together everybody who wants to play, set up some games and play them. I'm going to be streaming my game, we can, if, so if you just want to watch, you can watch, and then we'll do another game again at 7 o'clock at night, some multiplayer Civ 5 fun. So anybody interested, all you have to do is show up on TeamSpeak at the indicated time, 2 o'clock or 7 o'clock, on this Tuesday, the 19th. If you want to watch, I'll be streaming it on twitch.tv slash bridger15, or Team Legacy's team page, which you can find a link in the show notes. Now... The other thing I want to mention is that sometime in the future, we may do like a TF2 style event. And of course, I should also point out, it's a Guild Wars 2 show. What the hell are you talking about? Guild Wars 2 is not out yet. So we can't do any cool community events in the game. That's the idea behind this initiative. We're getting there eventually. Chat room's like, this is lame. I'm getting out. See you guys later. I want Guild Wars 2. All right. So if anybody has any uh, TF2 servers... It would be great if we could learn about that. Like, if you have admin on a server that we could password and use for a community event some point in the future, we might need five or six of them, but we've got a big community here, so maybe there's some people out there that have got a TF2 server that we could borrow for a night or so. So, if you could let us know, feedback at talesofteria.com. Com is how you can get a hold of us. Also, I'm aware that there's currently an issue with the links of the show notes. I'm going to fix that tonight, so do not panic by the time you hear this. If you're listening after the fact, it should be fixed. With all that finally out of the way, let me introduce the rest of the group that we have here. Ladies and gentlemen, you know them, you love them. The D1A, Division 1A of Team Legacy. Oh, I'm sorry, where did that picture come from? I, I meant to click over here. There we go. Welcome, everybody. Let me go around the table. Actellum, also known as Hara to the Team Legacy guys. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. You are the uh, de facto leader of our, our Division 1A, which is the, the structured PvP group that we have within Team Legacy. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. So why don't, why don't you just uh, give us a quick introduction? Uh, what, what's the goal of D1A? What's, what's the whole purpose? And then we'll get to everybody else here. Uh, well, it's to be a competitive, structured... PvP team for Team Legacy and Guild Wars 2. Our goal is to smash everything and get a gamer house. Awesome, awesome. So there's Actellum. Also joining us, Gigawatt, who has been on the show a couple times before. Welcome, sir. Thanks, sir. And uh, we also have 
Uh, next up on the list, Jacobin. Jacobin, how do you say your name? I'm sorry. Show when we're in professional news, but I'm just like behind the times on everything. Introduce us, us to yourself, sir. No, we can't hear you. Your microphone is muted. Still can't hear you. All right. While you take care of that, let's jump over to Quilp. What in God's name made you decide to take a name that has no vowels in it? Um, pretty much. Uh, when I used to play Dota a lot, uh, Priestess and Moon came out. <laughs> And I started making a troll name, just playing it and messing with her because she's really strong. And it was Mew Mew Pew Pew. And it carried over when I made a new name um, for the handle. And it's Case with Lasers Pew Pew. So there just happened to be no uh, vowels so in acronym. So it's, a, it's an, an acronym that you can't even pronounce. <laughs> it, it, it's like the best acronym because you can pronounce it any way you want to. All right, there we go. I think we got Jacobin on the... Uh, although I can My hear bad. myself echoing through right now. Uh-oh. <laughs> I got I got to figure out push to talk. I, anyways, yeah, it's, I, I usually pronounce it Jacobin. A lot of people say Jacobin. Um, I'm a big fan of the show. I, I was watching you guys back when you were talking about Endgame and all that long before Team Legacy came around. So I'm really happy to be on, and uh, let's have a great show. Excellent, excellent. Welcome everybody. It's good to have you guys all here. And let's jump into. Uh, we're still echoing just a tiny bit through through what's coming through on yours, uh, Jacobin. So if you can set up uh, push to mute, which I believe you can click a mute button there on Skype, that should fix that. Yeah, I got it. So let's yeah. go over the news briefly. Uh, we have a very awesome video I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, this one is called "The Beauty of Tyria," and it's basically a. Uh, uh, what's the word uh, uh, for when uh, you take a lot of shots? Over it's this thing. Somebody help me out. I'm I'm wordless right now. Time lapse. Time lapse. That's the word I'm looking for. Wow. Okay. Time lapse video. So if you've ever wanted to show off how awesome Tyria looks, hang on. Let me switch to 720p. Let's let's actually. There we go. If you ever wanted to show how awesome seven uh, uh, tells uh, Guild Wars 2 looks to people, this is the kind of video that you want to show them. It's just amazing how the environment can change over time. And again, the links to all this are in the show notes. The time-lapse video is beautiful. You've got, you know, water moving and trees swaying. And over the course of these time-lapse, the moon comes out and the sun sets. And, and it's just, it's amazing. One of these has like a volcano erupting in the background. Wow, look at this. I didn't even notice that. This is the middle of Divinity's Reach, and the, the, there's this big structure in the middle that kind of follows the sun, and it moves so slow you don't necessarily notice it. Wow, that is really cool. That guy stands in, in one place for a long time. Anyway, check out the video. Highly recommend. It's called The Beauty of Tyria. So uh, with all that, let's, uh, let's jump right back here. There we go. To what's next on the list. Now, this is a really cool website I found this week. This is called, it's actually sites.google.com slash site slash dw2dies. And what this is, is a way for you to sort of look at the dye palette in the game and, and see exactly what colors will look uh, like what on various characters. So we click on previews here, and you can see that there is a many, many different colors. And basically, I think all they did was dye every single possible thing in this outfit the same color to show you some of the different colors. And you can specifically, I think, look for specific colors. Or, or here, so this is grayscale, and and it's it's just got a lot of really interesting statistics and things so that. Uh, I think this, the statistics page here even has, like, rarities of the various bottles and stuff. So, very cool. Very cool. I think we're going to see a lot more of this. If I keep hitting the wrong thing, I'm going to kill myself here. Uh, we're going to see a lot more of this soon. So, check that out. Link, again, is on the show notes. Talesofteria.com is where you can find them. Next up here is a very interesting thread, and I wonder if you guys over here, the, the hardcore PvP guys, even care about this, but I thought I'd mention it because I thought it was pretty cool. The uh, Somebody asked about uh, that bonus XP when you kill a mob and it says, you know, 17 XP plus 22 bonus XP. Now, do you guys have any inclination about what exactly that is? Not in the slightest. No, you spent the entire time in the mist. Don't You'll even get care. XP for killing spawn here. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. All right. So the answer I found was in this specific Reddit thread in which somebody basically said the longer that a mob was wandering around in the world, the longer since it spawned, the more bonus XP you get. 
and that encourages you to explore hidden areas on the map or to, to, to branch out and go somewhere that nobody else has been in a while. And that's kind of a cool concept. I really like that. Um, and I think somebody else mentioned that it's sort of a combination of how long it's been on the map. Um, if you're getting XP for playing, you, I guess you get bonus XP for playing with your guild is what somebody says here. Um, if you've killed a lot of mobs uh, since the last time you were down, you get more XP if you don't die, basically, over time. You get a tiny bit, bit more bonus over time. Um, if you've killed a lot of mobs in a short time span, you get a little boost there automatically, not including that 50% uh, buff or whatever it is, 100% buff. Uh, from the kill streak uh, boost that you can buy in the gem store. This is just sort of a de de default thing in the game. So I thought that was a really cool little uh, experiment, and I and I really kind of wish that if you could use that, that hey, the game has been you know this character has spawned in and has been around for X minutes. I would love to see characters turn into stronger versions, like veterans or champions over a certain period of time. Like, not all of them. Not after, like, okay, after 20 minutes, this worm is going to turn into a super worm or something like that. But um, maybe a percent chance every minute after the 20-minute mark, there's a percent chance that maybe it'll turn into a veteran. And you can only have so many veterans in an area and maybe so many champions in an area. That would actually be really cool to me. I don't know. I, I assume you guys don't really have any thoughts on that. Do you guys play PV PvE at all? Sometimes, but not, I haven't really I played a single minute. <laughs> not a single second. Not a single second, he says. Okay. Does fighting golems count? Um, no. yes. I think <laughs> it does. So, uh, this might be a little bit more up your alley. Somebody, another person, uh, there's another Reddit post, because that's where I go for my entire life. Um, this is actually somebody who took formulas, I believe from the wiki, but I'm not sure where these formulas are derived, to create a graph of how condition damage um, stats on your gear affects condition damage that you actually deal. So let's take a look at the graph here. And what conclusions you can draw immediately is that bleeding by itself is the lowest start and sort of the lowest finish of obviously here um, because it can stack on top of itself. However, uh, a bleeding times five still does not do as much DPS as burning. It looks like somewhere around bleeding times seven, if you have seven stacks of bleeding on a target, then it's doing about as much damage as burning does. The other thing to notice is that bleeding tends to benefit a little bit more from condition damage than burning does. I think the, the formulas here are 0.5 times level times 0 0.05 times condition damage. Uh, so it's like 0.1 versus 0.5. So yeah, it looks like burning uh, benefits actually significantly more. I don't even know how to read these. But anyway, it's a really cool graph. You can check it out. Um, and it shows that once you get to bleeding times 10, you're doing a lot more damage than, than burning damage. Is this something that you guys maybe noticed while you, guys, while you were playing? Well, I... Well, while playing. Oh, okay. You're a little quiet, by the way, Giga. Can you move your mic a little closer? Well, I play a condition damage build, or I was running one this last weekend, and I noticed that uh, once I got it around nine stacks of bleed with a condition damage amulet, I was doing quite a bit of damage, I, th I think in the neighborhood of 1k per second with nine stacks up. So, yeah, condition damage was pretty, pretty, pretty powerful. Okay, excellent. So, uh, yeah, I thought this was really cool, and I thought I'd mention it. Again, the link is in the show notes for you guys. So uh, go ahead and check that out, talesateria.com. Let's jump over to the last thing that I have for you guys here in the news. Again, not a lot of news going on, not a lot of things to discuss, just some cool links that I wanted to share with everybody. And what we have here is another video. We think we featured one of Wooden Potato's lore videos a while ago, and this is the second now in that series. This is the fall of Ascalon. The humans had always relied on their five gods for protection. Now the Char had found gods of their own, the Titans. These fiery beasts from a distant land gave the Char power, enough to launch a new attack. Still, more than power, the Titans gave the Char an artifact, the Cauldron of Cataclysm, imbued with ancient magics older than the Char or even the Titans So you can see here, he's actually, I think he's got like an artist or somebody working for him, or maybe he's drawn all these, I don't know, helping him out, because this is really cool looking. He puts together a lot of sort of uh, images of what's going on, or maybe he's using fan art, but he does a very good job narrating and describing everything that happens. Uh, it's a 16-minute video, and it basically recaps everything that happens in the first half of the first 
Guild Wars game, uh, the first Guild Wars campaign prophecies. At least I think that I got about halfway through it. It seems like that's about the target time and date. So if you enjoyed his first one, which describes the geography of the world, highly recommend this one. Again, the link is in the show notes. Talesoftyria.com is how you can get to it. So I think that about does it for this week's um, you know, info in in the in in the news realm. Again, there's there's really not that much here this week. There's not much to go on. Uh, so I do want to jump right into our discussion, our roundtable discussion of structured PvP. So let's sort of go around and get everybody's sort of impressions, overall impressions of of what uh, what 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 they felt the this particular beta weekend number two was is it is it ready for prime time how much work does it need etc so actellum let's start with you what is your general impression what needs to be worked on etc well my general impression was it's it's kind of in a weird place right now they need they, well they might not need more nap, maps before release but it would it would be nice to see some included i don't really like kylo because it has a lot of los issues but I think nipple is pretty. <laughs> Somebody's pretty got solid. a dryer. Who's that? <laughs> Not me. Um, Nobody's messing far, up. <laughs> All right, go ahead. As far as uh, balance goes, I feel like it's in a pretty okay place. I think warriors are just still a little bit overtuned, a little bit. But I feel like everywhere everyone else is in a pretty okay place. Uh, engineers might need a retooling. Mesmer's. Well, if they fix the bug, they're going to need to be picked up a little bit. Uh, there's a, there's a, well, I'll let Gigawatt explain the bug. <laughs> um, but o overall, I, I feel like it's in a pretty good place. Uh, spectator mode, obviously, but yeah. Where that, is that's it? Just, yeah, that's beating a dead horse there. Um, so. All right. Uh, Gigawatt, what was your overall impression? Did you see any major adv improvements since the first beta weekend in maybe uh, response time for skills, for example? Um, I think everything felt pretty fluid all around. I think the game, you know, all together just ran a little bit smoother. Um, I noticed the graphics was a lot more optimized. I got a bit better frame rates overall, but, um, responsive, I think the responsiveness was just part of that. Um, for my profession, I noticed that Mesmer's are just in a crazy spot right now because shatter damage dropped almost 50%. And just became a totally unviable source of damage. And then illusion damage, the phantasmal haste trait, 20 points into illusions at the bottom line, was bugged. So for half the illusions, it seemed to do nothing. And the other half, uh, your phantasms would actually get <laughs> no cooldown on their skills, which was, <laughs> it felt it felt a lot better because their cooldowns used to be like 10 seconds. So they just sit there really? half the time and do nothing. Like, yes, the, but, like the pistol illusions where they go boom, 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 mm -hmm. boom, and then they'd sit there for a huge time going, yes. Ah! Really it's good being made out of ectoplasm. <laughs> but uh, they were definitely too strong in this one because they would just machine gun off and forever attack. And if you threw it on time warp, they would literally fire off like a machine gun. The duelist would never stop shooting. And they would do about 3,500 a combo if you're spec like 30 into dueling. Um, I'd say that's the biggest problem with the Mesmer right now is just lousy power scaling. Uh, not a good option for condition damage since Confusion's pretty terrible having the same scaling as Bleed, but with half the duration and the same base damage. Um, you just have a lack of options for condition damage, and Shatters are bad, and Illusion damage is going to come down into line, so there's a lot of tuning to be done overall, I feel, but this is the most fun PvP I've ever played in my life. It's fantastic. All right. Uh, Jacobin, what did you uh, feel uh, this, this weekend? I I is the... Is the core systems in place? All of the, all of the actual. I mean, regardless of balance, how does everything else feel right now? Uh, yeah, actually, I thought everything was in a, a really solid place. The responsiveness was improved over last weekend. Uh, the map that they had the tournament matches on was quite good. I mean, I would say the problem with the map is that it's very snowbally. If your team picks up double buff at the same time. Uh, oh, I didn't realize those you, stack. If you if you get the Chieftain yeah. and Svanir, that gives you 100 points in every uh, stat category. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you, you get the double stack on the buff. Your team's going to snowball. It's very hard for the other team to come back after that if you're able to pick up your own buff and then steal their buff. So that might be a bit of an issue with the competitive, 
competitiveness of uh, that particular map. But just in terms of skill responsiveness, everything was was very good. Really, the only technical problems we had were on Saturday when the uh, we got kicked out of a lot of uh, finals matches, and there was a lot of tournament errors. And sometimes one person on your team would have an error, so you couldn't queue up correctly, and uh, you'd have to log out or just wait for it to fix. But uh, generally, I was really happy. I think I think at least the tournament format is very close to release. Excellent, excellent. All right, uh, Quilp, what did, what were your thoughts? Any anything to add to to the to what the group has said so far? Um, yeah, I mean, it was a, pretty much a great weekend to play outside of Saturday for us because we couldn't do tournaments. But in terms of responsiveness, that was probably the biggest bonus that we got. Um, having to deal with like three plus second delays from beta weekend event made it pretty terrible to do anything at all. So having everything be responsive was probably the number one thing that made it important. Um, and then beyond that, there are uh, questions I have in terms of overall uh, being ready. Uh, spectator mode is obvious, that's not going to come out, but they are going to get it out eventually. But things like um, currently down states and their respawn timers, um, conditions, sigils and runes, those kind of things that are fine tuning, but some of it's pretty, pretty questionable because there's a lot of RNG involved in those aspects right now. Okay, Giga, you were mentioning something in the chat. You feel that currently the, uh, the, the tuning of the point system is not up to par, is that right? Well, right now, the big points come from monsters, at least on Nephilim. Uh, those are your primary source of points. When you get over to Kylo and you don't have that you know, 40-point boost, I think the matches are going to last quite a bit longer. Wasn't it 50 and... in the first beta weekend? Didn't they tone that down? Or maybe I'm misremembering. I'm not certain. Okay. Um, it but... was 50. So yeah. they did tone it down already, but you're saying it's still such a huge score. It's a huge swing. If you're able to get a steal, and we played against some teams who were very, very good at getting steals, um, you could get 80 points right off the bat and have the 100 points stat boost on your whole team, and it was just a devastating lead to try and uh, usurp. Unless you got a steal yourselves, you almost couldn't ever come back. Hmm. And the, the way I felt was that how it's been explained uh, in interviews thus far by ArenaNet and blog posts is that the CPs are the primary objective, Every map has a secondary objective, and then the kills are the tertiary objective. And right now, the kills are actually generating way more points than the primary objective, which seems off to me. Just yeah. it doesn't seem consistent with what they've said so far. Is it ten, Maybe they've 10 changed points their design per kill, philosophy right? on it. Yes, 10 points per kill. And, and the so, CPs generate what, like about 3 per 3 or 3 per 5, I believe. Oh, so, for, as far as per second? Uh, so three, mm -hmm. 3 points per 5 seconds or something like that? Each yeah. one or, or all together? Each, each, each one. Each one, okay. One. I don't know, remember the exact numbers on them, but it's definitely... Miane says point one point every kills. two seconds, so yeah, it's about, it's about uh, a half a point a second from each individual point. So if you have two points, it's one per second, I think is, is mm -hmm. basically what, what the current deal is. But yeah, when the matches can only last three to, to, to six or even, uh, like, well, three minutes might be a little short, but, uh, you know, six to ten minutes if you get those, uh, that double steal like you're talking about. And, uh, you know, they, they respawn fairly quickly, so it's possible, like you're saying, to shoot jump and if you've got what three kills in there kills are worth 10 points each isn't that right or is it five mm -hmm. it's 10 points it's each fine. and then that that Plus could five get for, you uh, finish if you finish them off it's five well that's that's glory not that's, that's yeah point, that doesn't yeah. give you points towards actual victory oh, right my bad <laughs> okay i think well you do have to finish them to actually get the points to your team right the da just getting yeah. them down doesn't give down you the points to your team anything. but when you do finish them that gives you 10 points to your team so assuming you finish two or three guys in that initial fight you're now at 110 to I don't know, like I don't know, maybe ten or or, or, or twenty on their team, um, and and or none or none, yeah, even yeah. <laughs> if they didn't even grab the point. So yeah, that that's a that's definitely a big swing. A fifth of the points that way is is a huge deal. And then if they respawn and you grab it again, that might just make you win. There were situations where it felt like the game was two or three minutes out from ending, and then just ended because they got uh, uh you know the chieftain and Svani are almost at the same time when we played. Uh, or we did one or the other, so that was that was very interesting. Okay, so let's dive in a little bit more to the tournament system. Uh, what did you guys feel the the tournament system? It, it's you know three rounds, single elimination, and what when it was working, obviously it had some issues. It's beta, whatever. Uh, when it was working, was it smooth? Did you move right from one match into another, Jacobin? How how was it working? Uh, for the most part, yeah, you could keep track of how many other teams were queued up, so you had a good understanding of how long the wait was going to be. 
the waits were could be long at times depending on the time of the day like prime time was obviously a lot quicker to, there was almost no wait time actually uh, but then later on in the day it would uh, slow down quite a bit um, just as far as just getting your party queuing up it worked well if somebody disconnected they would just log right back in they'd still be in the team in the queue you could switch your class your character uh, so I thought that system overall was uh, working. Oh, uh, so quite it, it keeps track of your account and not even your character. You, if you exactly. switch out, it'll keep you in the queue. That's really nice. That's kind of a feature that I wouldn't expect to be uh, to be there right at launch. That's kind of nice that they already you know had the foresight to see that. Absolutely. All right. Anybody else have any uh, you know things that? Oh, well, I wish the tournament system had this. No, I think overall I was pretty pleased with yeah. it. Yeah, I liked it a lot. Wow. Okay, that's a pretty uh, impressive, impressive uh, thing to come with. The, the hard guy PVP. There, let's do it. And they're like, eh, yeah. it's pretty good. That's awesome. <laughs> so, I'd like to see how the monthly tournaments go. Yeah, that's one thing we haven't seen yet. But yeah, so, what I'm do you really... guys? What do you guys think? Let's speculate a little bit because I don't think anybody has any information. You, you go to the tournament guy and you click on I want to I want to see a tournament and he's and it says free tournament and paid tournament. It says you have to submit tickets. Um, has anybody have any solid information on what that is? I think we're all speculating at this point, right? Yeah. Yes. So my speculation has been that you can get the tickets maybe in the gem store, and that would give you more or better glory you know, chests at the end of the tournament, but it wouldn't give you more qualifier points or anything that mechanically affected the game. Uh, would you guys be okay with that? I mean, w w I wonder if the paid tournaments are going to be completely separate, if that's splitting too much of the potential traffic on the tournament scene. I don't know. Does anybody have any strong feelings one way or the other on that? I thought tickets were qualifier points. Yeah, that's kind of how I interpreted it, too. Yeah. yeah. Because it call it's... it's uh... I don't think so, because it's called paid tournaments, which implies that there's some kind of a cost. I feel like the qualifier points would be called qualifier points, and, and the monthly tournaments would be called either monthly or qualifying points or something else. Not paid is a weird word to use if that's what that is. Um, I'd... Sorry. I don't know. Somebody I, I says somebody through. says they should have the ability to gamble on teams. <laughs> like I, that would be really interesting if you could once they get spectator mode in there. If you could see you know a tournament laying out and you're like two gold on Team Legacy for the win. <laughs> that would be really interesting. Oh man, um, Anarian Anarian wants to know where the info is. The info is in the beta weekend. If you walked up to the tournament guy, it said free tournament and paid tournament. If you clicked on paid tournament, it says. This is not ready yet, but when it is, you'll be able to get to, to pay tickets to get better rewards at the end of the tournament. So that's all we know. That's all I know, at least, anyway. So uh, that, we'll see how that actually uh, comes out. So I guess that's, that's kind of it for the tournament system. Uh, I mean, I don't know how much you guys care about the glory changes to the glory system and the glory rewards. Is there any... Do you guys really care? I mean, there was always a big thing where a lot of people are like, clearly arena that's going for the money grab here they change it from what buy what you want to random here got that kind of passion over glory rewards i mean uh they actually stated how they're gonna fix it already they only implemented half of the new system so uh yeah glory is currency and you get these treasure chests which are random but they already stated that there's gonna be a forge just like the mystic forge to craft new items pretty much you're gonna salvage the items you don't want from your treasure chest mm -hmm. or whatever you get it from put it inside and pick an item you do want so you're not gonna get one for one but you're gonna have to you still get the item you want in the end cosmetically right and we kind of talked about that last week. I just wanted to see, since we're talking about the structured PvP, if there was any strong feelings one way or the other. I didn't really care. But yeah, I it's just a lot, of people, a lot of people out there really liked it. Like, I saw some blog posts, and I was searching about people who were just, like, ecstatic that now they could get this random drop. They open it, they're excited <laughs> to open the chest. I'm like, Those are the kind of whatever. people that you never bring to a casino. <laughs> well, it, it hey, you feel... got this box where you pull a handle every once in a while. It'll spit coins out at you. Here's the catch, though. You got to put a coin in every time to pull the handle. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Who was talking there? I, I was going to speak up. It did feel really good when you got a, a gold box and like four or five things came out of it that you could use. Well, ah. I wanted to use like it, oh, I don't let's know. Talk it just about felt really good. Maybe, rewards... maybe I'm too used to the the WoW mechanics where when you kill a boss, you just roll some dice and hope that you got something. Yeah, 
And so, so what did you get for winning a tournament? Did you just uh, get gold, a bunch of those glory boxes? Uh, gold chest. Gold one, yeah. The gold chest. First place. Yeah, and first I think the chest. chest is supposed to be like one level higher than your current rank, if I'm not mistaken. Or it's the equivalent of like a rank two or the second glory vendor. So if you won the tournament this weekend, it was the equivalent of a rank two glory vendor gold chest. Even if you were ranked to glory, rank I have two, no. I don't know or... if, you're, if you are ranked to already, but I know for a fact um, hmm. it was the equivalent early on. Interesting, interesting. That kind of makes sense, you know, because otherwise you could just go buy whatever you want. But this is a way to get something higher, so that entering a tournament can actually get you something that you can't get normally simply by buying. So yeah, that that's kind of a cool concept. Is you know, you get a glory chest one tier higher than the tier that you currently are. And I'm guessing you know, there's 12 or 20 tiers or something like that. I saw them like there's just you know stairwells going up <laughs> into the sky, and there's like a new glory guy on each rank, and it just seems like oh, it's just gonna keep going forever. And I'm guessing if you got exponential requirements so that there's going to be, like, you got to have to play like 30,000 games before you can get level 20, you know, gear or whatever. We'll see how that actually shakes down. Um, the highest one you could talk to is rank 10, I think. And that was 7,500,000. Wow. <laughs> and rank no, no. two is like, if you've got 1,500, you can talk to me. <laughs> so, wow. There was, there was a whole other, uh, like, building with them on the other side yeah, of the Yeah, I saw that one. Uh, yeah, there are I like saw that three buildings. First. There are like twelve of them. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There was yeah. a ridiculous amount. All right. Uh, so let's jump into uh, talking a little bit more about the maps. We talked a little bit about Niffle Hell. How do you guys feel about the layout of Niffle Hell, Jacobin? Does the layout? I, I actually kind of feel it. It feels better than Kylo. And I think that somebody had mentioned line of sight issues. Do you share that? Um? Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I, I don't really like. There's a lot of different elevations that you have to deal with, and uh, yeah, line of sight issues where you you uh, can basically block people's attacks against you in areas that don't look like they should be able to. And uh, just, I, I'm not a big fan of the clock tower. How there's ramps up and 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 different ways in and out. I mean, whoever controls the clock tower seems to have a pretty heavy advantage because they can jump out of the top and run to the other points much quicker. Uh, the trebuchet is a pretty big X factor, and it's 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 just kind of annoying to deal with. I mean, I'm sure when it's more competitive, that'll you know if that's a competitive map, then con using the trebuchet will obviously be a, a key you know skill factor on that. But as it stands now, with uh, the eight versus eight and all that, it's it's it's, it's kind of an annoyance factor. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm really glad they just kept it to uh, the Niflheim map, and um, it, it it just felt a lot smoother, a lot more balanced and uh, I don't know I just I, I personally just enjoyed it more all right anybody else uh, you know have a, an opinion on one map or the other or have a differing opinion I mean I agree with Jacob I think forest is just a much better map in general because there's an easier in place comeback mechanism with the NPCs um, and I also really hate trebs it's just like 15k <laughs> damage you're knocked down points contested everyone just falls down and it becomes like kill the treb and pair the treb game um, not to mention line of sight issues with the axis on going on top of the building in the middle, but just overall more friendly for just people playing in general um, because you can get those 40 extra points back right away. Um, it can snowball kind of heavy, but I think overall it makes it more dynamic and exciting to play. Excellent. I, and I do like how even though forest seems very linear, there are a lot of back paths. Like there's the beach path that you can use to go down uh, to <laughs> Gigawatt. You want to tell your dad he's on? He's, he's being watched by 150 people. <laughs> <laughs> so um, th there is the, the beach path that you can use to try and like steal the enemy's close point uh, without them watching uh, and, and there's, uh, th there's the back path that you can use from like the chieftain or the spawn your spawn that goes up to the keep and I kind of like the, the one way direction that they've set up there so you can't use it to go from the keep back to the Chieftain or Svanir. You can only use it to get up there, and it's kind of a really interesting way. But you have to jump down if you want to take the point. So you can go up there, and you can use that as, a, well, I can stay up here and retreat really easily, but then my opponent can take the point, and I can't do anything, or I can't actually take the point from him. I, I feel like that design is really well done, and the fights around uh, the mine and the henge uh, both feel really cool. There's, like, not 
a lot of line of sight stuff, but what is there is kind of cool. And the elevation changes are only a few feet, but it makes a difference between where you can and can't go. And there's a couple of choke points, and it, it just felt like a really, really well-designed map. I enjoy Kylo as well, um, but definitely not as much. Um, and, I'm, and I'm with you guys there. Uh, I do like the fact that it changes depending upon what the trebuchets hit. I just feel like that, in a structured PvP, like, a tournament environment, it's, it's just, okay, we're going to destroy the things that are most useful to us. It doesn't feel like it's chaotic enough, I guess, where random things are going to change the way it plays each time. But I guess you guys wouldn't want that anyway. <laughs> no. All right. Uh, so any other final comments uh, on... Uh, well, actually, let me ask you guys. Did you guys see a metagame evolving on the forest map? Did Was, like, all the teams figured out, okay, we need to send four guys after our NPC, one guy after theirs, or one guy to this point, one guy to that point, three after the NPC? Ek, tell them, how did you guys... Uh, did you see something evolving over the weekend? Uh, not really. Most people were just kind of randomly queuing in and uh, go going with a pre-planned strat. I don't think there was really enough time for Meta to shake out. Uh, I, I noticed that there were a few more successful strategies, but uh, not a lot of people were necessarily running them, or the people that were running them weren't being countered very hard because there was no Meta. So it's, it, I, I think with a couple more uh, weeks of playtime, people actually shake down a Meta, but there's not currently a strong one going. Okay. Interesting. Now... Let's talk about classes and builds. Uh, so let's go one of you to the next and talk about your class. Uh, we heard Gigawatt talk a little bit about the Mesmer. So, Ak, tell him, what class did you play, and how did you feel it was balance-wise? Uh, is, there, is there any useless traits, great traits, anything that was really awesome? I played a Thief and a little bit of a Necromancer. Um, the Thief, I feel like, is in a pretty good place. Dagger damage got brought down a little bit, so it's not as, I, I don't know, People people want to say face roll, so I'll I'll say it's not as face roll as it used to be. You can't just heart smash your uh, two key heart seeker and win it all, all fights everywhere ever. Um, I do feel like leaping death blossom probably could hit harder, but eh, it looks um, so cool. It really should hit hard. <laughs> well, it's got an evade on it now. They changed that from last weekend, so that that is an added bonus to it, I guess. But I don't know. The dagger coefficients got brought down, and I just uh, didn't feel like stacking power was that effective with dagger dagger anymore hmm. the way they the way they changed the the numerical display made pistols feel a lot stronger but i don't know if they actually are um i'm for those of you that aren't aware when you ran a or when you when you hit unload or any ability that hit multiple times it would just pop up and display like the total damage not the damage per hit uh, like it did last weekend so that might be a little confusing to everyone hmm. but yeah, I feel like Pistol Pistol still has pretty good output, especially when you pair it with Haste. Uh, I, I wish I'd got to try more Sword Pistol or Dagger Pistol, because I feel like Pistol's a really strong offhand, and I would have liked to run more of it, but I didn't, didn't get the chance this last beta weekend. I mainly stuck with a Dagger Dagger uh, Shortbow Condition Damage build, and was fairly successful with it because you could kind of sneak in and get like 10 stacks of bleed on people before they realized what was going on and then leave <laughs> while they were all at half health and they would fall over dead. But I don't think that's... I don't... And they'll probably... Condition removal is, is something yeah. that basically destroys that strat, right? Yep. Uh, if I fought anyone with condition removal, I just had to run away. <laughs> there, there, was, there was no counter to it. Either I killed someone or they, I, uh, I, I got... They could remove the conditions, and I was pretty useless. But I, I don't know. It, it shook out okay. Um, as far as talents go, or traits, excuse me, I feel like acrobatics is really strong on Thieves right now. Uh, you have uh, two minor traits that are really good. One gives swiftness on evade. The other reduces the or returns some of the endurance you use when you evade. So you can get three endurances or three endurances, three dodge rolls out of a full endurance bar. So it, it was it was really strong. And when you paired that with the uh, break, immob not immobilize, break, chill, and cripple talent, it's a, it's a major talent. It should be in the 20, uh, 20 slot. Next one, that one, yep. It, it, it came out to be one of the, one of the strongest uh, overall trees or 
trait trait trees. I like all the all the stuff that has to do with uh, dodging, like that, especially if you can get those um, those boosts to uh, to endurance. That 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 would be a real. I, I really like those trees because it feels so cool to to dodge out of the way of important attacks, and it feels a little bit more uh, actiony, I guess you could say, than uh, than the, what you normally see in traditional uh, you know MMOs with the hotkeys and things like that. So I think yeah. I would enjoy that style too. I played around a tiny bit with a thief uh, when I was waiting for somebody else to, to come along so we could play the, the dungeon uh, and or go PvP, but uh, I, I can't talk too much about it. Gigawatt, did you play anything besides Mesmer or were you focused entirely on Mesmer the whole week? Gigawatt can't hear me. Took over. <laughs> I guess so. I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> um, um... The Mesmer was all I played over the weekend. Okay. Um, Did you have anything to add besides to what you said before? Weapons. Uh, they got some problems with weapons. They got problems with uh, staff just not being a reliable condition applicator and not being a reliable CC applicator. Just like, Chaos Storm is a 1 in 3 to CC. Um, and the auto attack is a 2 in 3 to actually apply condition damage. So they've just got issues with their kit there. Uh, the scepter is terrible. The auto attack is a tickle beam, and if you're running phantasms, generating clones is so bad because it doesn't react intuitively and not shred phantasms hmm. when you create clones. They do get just poofed away, and then you have a clone that literally hits for two damage. And I think that's a bug. I think they're changing that. But uh, in this beta weekend, the clones were all hitting for two damage as opposed to like 80 or 100 like they were before. Uh, that's really bad. Um, you also can't vulnerability stack with the sword. Uh, but the sword is still the only good weapon, really. <laughs> you have the sword and pistol, and those are the really viable ones, and the rest of it's just kind of subpar. They had their dazes hit via the trait that... The t I think it was the 15-point minor in Domination that used to increase dazes by one second. That's gone. And then they took daze off of Chaos Storm, and they took daze off of Mind Stab on the Great Sword. So they've got a lot of issues looking for a viable offset to go with sword pistol. The utilities are straight. Their utilities and their um, their ultimate abilities, especially, are amazing. Moa Morph and Time Warp are fantastic game changers. Oh, Moa! <laughs> like, yeah, nobody likes to get Moa'd. No. Nope. <laughs> but uh, aside from that, they're really struggling in the weapon department. It's their scaling on the weapons is not great, and just looking for them to get tuned up. I'd like to see Shadow Damage come out as a viable option, rather than going from you know really good to terrible i'd like to see so what do you do instead of shattering we'll do you use uh confusion at all to, to as your as your main confusion is terrible really because it just doesn't do enough got... damage well the problem is it has the same base damage and scaling as bleed and half the duration ah so it's got the same duration as a burn but you know one fourth of the base damage and one fifth and can be completely scaling. nullified if your opponent just dodges for a mm -hmm. while instead of well maybe dodge does it but you know breaks line of sight until it wears off yeah like the three seconds that confusion will last yeah but so, it, does it stack in duration like if you had three illusions and they all intensity. shattered oh it's it in intensity in wow so mm -hmm. that is a very short short duration there ah yeah. when your shatters on a full damage build a full power build are only crit for like 1700 like, all you have is illusion damage, and they get killed really fast in, like, one, two skills. Unless you're using phantasms with a broken trait. <laughs> you bring them out, and then an Elementalist uses, like, one skill from their scepter, and they're gone. <laughs> they're true. Like, it's like, what do I do? Welp. <laughs> Oh, you, on the other hand, you can kind of warrior around, and they just stand no chance. Well, the the mesmer is uh, one of the only other classes that has a lot of, um, or at least some amount of uh, stealth, sort of baked into a lot of their mechanics. Did yeah, you they, use that to a large degree? Um, no, I didn't. I used it for a little while when I was running the mantra heal skill because it allowed me to make some plays when I could stealth and get another heal off. That was pretty good, but um, overall, you have to get really use a torch for that. And the torch is only viable really in condition damage build where you get that burning, I feel, um, because its phantasm isn't that great. Okay. Uh, Jacobin, uh, you play a Ranger, right? Yeah, Ranger and Guardian, but mainly Ranger. I've actually got uh, some the footage first here. Videos is going to be very, very important for this build. But Stop talking. 
There we go. I get feared. This is this is I believe uh, you discussing your ranger build and and showing how you two v one a couple of guys and and you know the strengths and weaknesses of the build. I'll put a link to this in the show notes. It's pretty cool. It's very interesting to see this kind of thing from you know because I never I didn't play the ranger. I was playing elementalist and a little bit of warrior over the weekend. Uh, so I love to see what other classes are capable of. Uh, sorry, professions are capable of and see what's going on. So if you guys want to check this out, highly recommend it. This is also in the show notes. So Jacob, and why don't you give us sort of the the summary of the video that you put here. How how is how did you find the ranger? Is it uh, you know decent? Is everybody's complaining about the pets? What's going on there? Um, yeah, the the ranger has a lot of very good options. I actually think it's in a, a pretty strong place right now. Uh, the the uh, in at least in the fives matches, the the bows are actually quite weak right now. That's an opinion I have that some people have disagreed with me with just in different forms and things, but. I, the the problem with the bows, the short bow mainly, is it's too situational and low damage. The problem with the long bow is the two skill rapid shot is quite a high damaging shot, uh, move, but the rest of the skills aren't too good. The knockback's okay, but basically you're you're using one skill to DPS and then everything else isn't too good. And then the other problem is that on uh, the forest map, there's not very many opportunities where you can fight at far range. Generally, you're going to be fairly close to the people you're fighting. Uh, because you need to be on the points or you need to be near the buffs. So bows are pretty much out. That being said, uh, Great Sword was a really fantastic weapon because it has a very good gap closer. The three hit combo on the one skill, the third hit gives you an evasion. So while you're running through their team, through their team, the enemy team spamming your one skill, every third hit is an evasion. So that improves your survivability. The uh, five skill is a stun from behind or daze from in front, so you can swoop in with your gap closer, hit the stun, hit your quickening Zephyr skill on your uh, utility, which is like uh, Warrior Frenzy, uh, the quickness, four second quickness. So you, ju you swoop in, hit the stun, hit your quickening Zephyr, then spam your one skill, and you're attacking super fast, you're evading, you're doing very high damage, you've got a bit of CC. Uh, so the uh, and and just generally the uh, coefficients seemed pretty good on the great sword. It had pretty high damage, so I was running a, a mainly a tanky build with power, so a lot of uh, vitality and toughness, and then uh, then a bunch of power, and that that worked out really well in the great sword. Um, much much better skills and more uh, more effectiveness than the bows, and then of course the second weapon set would be the axe and Warhorn, which was also incredibly effective. The axe alone is much better than the bows because they're in the uh, skirmishing trait line. You get the 33% crit damage boost, so that makes your criticals quite a bit higher. The uh, It spans conditions better than the uh, than the bows because your three skill is, or your two skill is uh, from up close. You can hit the guy, you can hit the guy with five bleeds. Uh, and then your uh, three skill is the chill, which is uh, slows their skill and movement, and it's on a pretty low cooldown. So it's actually better than the bullets in spamming conditions, does higher damage, and the one skill caused bouncing axes, so you can hit a small AoE radius. So it's just much more effective. And then, of course, the Warhorn offhand grants you the Call of the Wild, which is a team wide speed buff, and um, also gives you the offensive buffs, the. Uh, Critical in critical rate increase and the uh, the power buff. So general, that was pretty much what every ranger I, was, I saw was run, running was great sword, axe, warhorn. It was clearly the most viable set. Uh, and the more the the better teams we fought, that's exactly what the rangers were running. It was exactly what I was running. It was easily the most effective uh, combination. Now in regards to the pets, yeah, the pets did have some problems. Uh, the pet the problem with the ranger is that it's only hard CC comes from the pets. They're the only things that do stuns uh, and knockdowns and that kind of thing. So you're hitting your your stun skill for your pet, your F2, and if your pet's not by your opponent, you know who knows if it's going to hit. You might be hitting it five or six times before it finally hits. Uh, your pets. Are there any, to, I haven't played a ranger. Are there yeah. any pets that do any kind of ranged attacks or ranged skills? Like, is there yes, a spider that shoots spiders. web or something like that? Is that the only one? The... I believe so. There might be other ones, but they weren't that good. The spiders were nice because they had ranged auto attacks and then a ranged uh, stun or immobilize. The problem is, is those spider attacks are projectiles, so they can miss. So you can use your stun attack, then it can miss. Um, and, and the spiders have, because they're ranged, they trade off HP and uh, some other U CC utility. 
like for instance, the wolf would have a two second fear and a knockdown, and the hound would have a, uh, an immobilize and a knockdown. So they would have they would eat, the certain pets would have two pretty powerful CC skills. So that's mainly what I use. I'm sure there's other pets that can do other things, but I just didn't use them because I felt the hard CC would be a better option. Uh, but like I said, you can't count on your pets. They often will, they basically attack your closest target. So well, that's usually not ideal. Usually you don't always want to attack your closest target. You want to switch to whatever target your teammates are The called. elementalist that's nuking you from the back. You want him Precisely. to be CC'd. You don't care about the warrior that's built tanky. Yeah. Exactly. So if you're, you're babysit your pet make sure you're uh hitting the f3 or whatever skill it is to, or f1 to attack your target but you know it's enough it's a thing that you have to worry about that other classes don't have to they can press a button get a cc while you have to kind of micromanage your pet in order to ensure you're getting hard ccs the other problem with pets it very quickly they have very low hp like only around 3000 at least the ones i was using the ones with the better cc skills have low hit points so 3000 hits is going to die very quickly to oh, AOE wow, damage yeah. That's that's like yeah. that's like one fourth even the lightest weight you know profession in the game like an elementalist or or a guardian like they they might they at the least are gonna have like twelve thousand HP so yeah that's really low is there yeah, any way low. that you can customize the health on your pet or does the pet scale uh, with the gear that you have like does your vitality extend to your pet or anything like that I don't believe so you can spec in the beast mastery trait line to improve the statistics on your pet but it's not by very much. The, the thing is though, it, it, even though the pets are very soft and die, when you do pet swap, that revives your pet. So you do the pet swap, you What's switch What's the cooldown your... on the pet swap by default? Is it like 15 or 20 seconds? Around there, yeah, it's pretty long. So, but still, if your pet dies, you can swap to your other pet and it will appear right next to you and then revive your other pets. When you swap back, it'll, it'll be alive again. It's almost like I felt the pet swapping was kind of put in as a fix to poor AI. Like if your pet runs off you could, and you don't know where it is, you just swap to your other pet and it's right back next to you. Uh, if it dies, you can swap and bring it right back next to you. So basically pet swapping is, uh, you know, kind of makes up for the fact that they uh, do not necessarily have the best AI. But it's a big X factor. I think that'll be a skill cap with the cat, with the ranger classes, being able to manage yourself as well as manage your pet. And that, then you've kind of uh, got a potential option that maybe a warrior might not necessarily have. And it sounded like ArenaNet has mentioned that their their pet AI is not yet at its final stage, and they're still working on it. But you know, we'll we'll have to see if it gets improved again. Uh, did you play anything else besides Ranger, or are you focus entirely on Ranger the whole weekend? Uh, no, I also played quite a bit of Guardian. I know Quilp was also playing on Guardian. Um, I knew one of you had to play Guardian if you were winning matches. <laughs> yeah, well, we found we yeah we usually we pretty much almost always had a Guardian in our build, so we had uh, three people sort of rotating around Guardian. Um, if we didn't have one, then I would switch from my Ranger to Guardian. So, so we can, I don't know if you want to talk about it now or later. Uh, let's let's talk with uh, with Quilp, and then we'll get into the Guardian discussion, because that was one of the ones that everybody was talking about over the weekend, was how ridiculous the Guardians were. And we talked a little bit about that last week, and the Guardians that were stacking healing and defensive maneuvers are just unkillable, regenerate faster than you can damage them. It was ridiculous. Uh, is that Was Guardian your main Quilp, or were you pl maining something else? I was maining Warrior. Um, I started off Guardian, went to Warrior, and then started messing with Guardian again once we started changing our opening and then back to Warrior. Um, so I just focused on Warrior for myself, but uh, I pretty much think in terms of versatility, all classes, Arena should make all classes similar to the Warrior. It can pretty much do everything pretty well and some things even better. Um, so it fits in in almost any possible way with whatever you want to do. Um, the one downside for the Warrior right now in Structure would probably be its Elite um, and the limitations of utilities. I actually ran a pretty uh, cheesy shout support build that would never die, and it's focused heavily on just pretty much ceasing everything down to the point of where um, I wouldn't die personally with like 2k heals on shouts, and I just CC people for as long as possible, but you have no 1v1 potential, and with player kills becoming so important, um, the build kind of just, we pretty much turned away from the build itself. It just doesn't provide enough damage. Um, but with Warriors in terms of utilities, there's really only four strong choices. Uh, Frenzy, because it gives Quickening, which is probably the strongest boon in the game. Um, Endure Pain, it's five seconds immunity. Bull's Charge, because I think it's kind of bugged 
it's almost a guaranteed knockdown for whatever reason. Even when you're recovering from stun, you still get knocked down. Um, and then balance dance because of stability. And um, with those four utilities, uh, pretty much everyone's going to run at least two of those almost every single time. Um, and then the adrenaline bars are pretty easy to fill up. So you get guaranteed Earth Shakers or guaranteed Eviscerates constantly in the game. So it's really, really good in terms of what they can do. Um, as weapons, I really think Hammer is a ha must-have by default. I think almost every single warrior would say Hammer is a must-have. Earthshaker is the best first skill you can get on a warrior, and it has three big CC skills. Um, offhands, I see kind of being a trade-off thing. I saw not many Warhorns to probably get the movement speed buffs through other classes, um, but I think it has one of the best conditions, which is weakness, um, and it's AoE which is really, really nice because most weakness applications are single target. Um, but I didn't also see mace offhands that much. I saw a lot of shields, and I think mace offhand is probably the best offhand for warrior right now, uh, mainly because it's five skill gives an extra CC into your whole chain of CCs. It's a straight line two second knockdown that you can increase with like a sigil paralyzation and then put like runes of the mesmer on top and it becomes a three second CC uh, along with everything else you use. Um, Obviously, Visser is really popular and probably the biggest cry for being OP along with Killshot. So they nerfed both of those skills actually. Killshot apparently got ruined. Um, I didn't. I never played Rifle myself, but it got really, really bad. Like half its damage is gone. But um, if Visser dropped down to like 10k on light armor, it used to be like 14k plus if you went all out on it, uh, which is really, really nice. But um, I just think mobility with the sword is far more important than having a burst skill with the axe. Uh, if you're running hammer anyways. So, um, I mean, overall, I don't, I think warriors are in a really good place. It's maybe to the point of being, I guess, overpowered. And I only say that in one, in one instance. Um, everyone knows about this pretty much, but downstate warrior is easily the best downstate in the game. Your two skill, which you have right away, is a knockdown that works with your Sigil Zone runes. So if you time your knockdown right before they finish you, you can get yourself a guaranteed vengeance. And what vengeance does is like seven seconds or whatever of just running around at full health killing people. Um, and if you want to be super gimmicky, you can just trade it and rally on a kill. It's a chance, but it's a really high chance anyways. But um, how I feel is that- Rally people, on a down rather than rally on a defeat. Is that the you, idea? You can, well, if you vengeance, you can rally on a kill from vengeance oh. as a trade chance. Um, so it's pretty gimmicky, but at the same time, it's just you can get a guaranteed vengeance. Um, and vengeance, for those that don't know, it's, it's a, a special skill in the down state that the warrior has. And essentially what it does is, it's, you said it's on seven seconds. After seven seconds after being down, the warrior can get back up for, what, 10 seconds? Or is it 12? Something around that yeah. ra range. And fight. 15, I think. But is it 15? They can get up, back up for 15 more seconds and fight, but then they're guaranteed to die at the end of that 15 seconds. They don't get another chance to get up. But what you're saying is there's a trait that makes them have the p possibility to rally if they manage to get a full kill in that 15 seconds. Normally it's a, well, instead of trying to get up, I'm going to forego that in order to keep fighting for 15 more seconds and then go down forever. Unless I take this trait, <laughs> and then it's then there's no downside at all. Okay, so yeah, and very it's interesting. A yeah, like, and you're not tried to not make it guaranteed because in Beta Weekend Event One, you were guaranteed vengeance. So they nerfed the they nerfed it the cooldown of the three skill to make it not guaranteed. But if you get the proper sigils and runes, you can make it guaranteed again. So they're probably going to nerf the cooldown a bit longer. But I think the down state of other classes should be more like the warriors. It's not just sitting there and doing nothing, waiting for your allies, but rather you're down there and you can change the outcome of team fights if given the chance. Yeah, I like the the one and you know two skills in the down state should be things that, that make you, not necessarily just damage, like a lot of them are just like, yep, just do some damage if you hit your one skill. But I like that the elementalist, for example, is an immobilize for a little while, which means if you, your enemy hits you from afar and you can quickly immobilize them, you can buy them a little bit more time or buy yourself a little bit more time to maybe get your mist form off. Like you said, there's got to be some more active things in the downstate to make it worth keeping in the game. Um, yeah. All right, so any, any final follow, follow through on warrior there? Um, elites. Just never get Juggernaut. It's pretty terrible. What does that do? It, it transforms you into like a 30k hit point CC bot. But the problem is that you can't really <laughs> move. So it's like the equivalent of fighting on a capture point, And everyone just runs away and you're worthless. So well, yeah. yeah, okay. 
So which which ultimate that you, the other ultimates that you have is like the banner, right? There's a big yeah. banner, and then uh, I don't remember what the last Signet one is. Signet of Rage is the other one. Signet of Rage. Um, okay. Almost everyone runs Rage just because Battle Standard is really good for World versus World versus World because there's so many people, so you're almost guaranteed to rally five people or four people with it. But in structured PvP, you're not running into five v fives. You're running into like two v twos, two v ones, three v twos, these really small skirmishes, and you're not guaranteed. So like to maximize it, you want to save it till multiple people are downed, but you're only playing on res one person ever at mm -hmm. a time with it. So you might as well just run rage. And if you want to rage, it gives you 20 seconds of swiftness. So you don't always have to be next to someone and it opens up your offhand slot. And it, it, adrenaline boost is nice, but it doesn't really matter for the passive ability. So you have like maybe a 50% a downtime without swiftness and throughout the whole game. And I like that it has the passive is grants adrenaline. That only grants adrenaline while in combat now, right? Isn't that Correct. one of the changes yeah. they made to the warrior? Because people were running across world versus world, and then when they got to somebody, they had full adrenaline. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I'm going to unleash my biggest, the thing that's supposed to be the finisher at the beginning of combat. <laughs> Pretty much, and that's why you actually see Healing Surge used. It was actually, healing Surge was considered easily like the worst healing skill of all three, but now it's become Healing Signet being the worst because you can... You surge, it gives you a, your first level bar, so you can start mm -hmm. a fight with your Earthshaker before a fight even begins. So that's the main reason why people are using it now. Interesting. Okay, good. I love to hear this stuff about the, the, the various classes or professions that I haven't played yet. It really gives you an idea of what to expect when you come up against them. So remember, if you see a warrior go down, you better finish him ASAP before he gets up and vengeances you to death. Uh, so you definitely want to avoid that. Um, all right, or, or run. If you run fast enough, then his vengeance is not vengeance. <laughs> he's like, oh, oh, he's gonna get back up. Better hightail it. <laughs> all right, so uh, let's see. Uh, next thing I wanted to uh, discuss was the Guardian, and I believe uh, Gigawatt or, or somebody here was was kind enough to link this particular video. Let's let's go ahead and show this. This is how to start your structured PvP match as a Guardian. So, the first thing that you do is hightail it for the enemy's point with as much swiftness as you can muster. It looks like he's going to have swiftness almost all the way there. Dodge past the enemy and get to the point before they can cap it. They're on the point. They're about to cap it. Nope. Now he's going to start a four-on-one. And watch how damn long this guy... I didn't even click over to it. Freaking buttons never go. There we go. Now he's going to start a four-on-one. He pops his elite, which is the defensive elite with the Tome of Knowledge. Is that the one? Courage. Is that what, Tome of Courage. That's the one that he's using now. And he's just yeah, sitting there so. tanking all of this damage. And, oh, he's in trouble. He just goes back to full 35,000 hit points with this, with his five skill. He's, there's four people unleashing everything on him. He's still at half health. He's going to pop his heal. He's going to go back up to full or near full. It's, it, this is ridiculous how long he's lasting here. Finally, his teammates come to join because they've capped the rest of the map while he's fighting on this one point by himself. We're now at one minute and 15 seconds into the match and he's still sitting here tanking four people. It's ridiculous, and I know they're going to be fixing it, but this is this is what you missed if you played if you didn't play Instructor PvP this past weekend. Now, did you guys ever find a way to get past what the Guardian is doing here? Is there anything that you can do, stat vulnerability, or anything else that can deal with this? Um, um this, there's yeah. Go ahead, Ara. There are a few things you can do. Uh, Basilisk Venom and Mo will both shut down the tome, and uh, ah. Yeah, that, that's the main threat right there. Other than that, you can get up to the edge of his sanctuary and hit him through it. I don't know if that's intended or not. I'm assuming not, but you can do it. Um, is sanctuary the big bubble or the small bubble that bounces you back? It's the small bubble Okay. that you can't really hit through. Uh, yeah, those two things would have probably shut him down, e either of those. Interesting. Uh, and if, if you can't do either of those, just run away from him. He's rooted. So you're saying, right, true, but in this, in this case, the example was we're standing on your point, <laughs> and even with four people, you can't kill me. Uh, so you're saying the real problem is Tome of Courage. If you fix Tome of Courage to not quite be so strong, then that would fix the Guardian uh, as far as this weekend, or is there other, there are other issues that need to be addressed? I think uh, Quelpin and Jacobin, you guys played a little bit of Guardian? 
Yeah. 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 If I can just jump in, I, that, you, you got to remember, yeah, the Tome of Courage, if you have high health, does give you the 20 seconds of basically invincibility. But you got to remember, you're not really doing any damage or anything yourself. And if, uh, so, you know, it's a great anchor skill. You can sit on a point and nobody can really get you off of it unless they have one of the skills uh, Actella mentioned. But, you know, you're not really able to kill or do anything to anyone else. Um, so, particularly in, uh, you know, that happened to be a one versus four, but what would happen in 5v5 fights is uh, you would get into a team fight in middle, say three versus three or something, you pop, you pop your tome, you get the heal off, you get the four, which is an AoE stun, but now you have a choice. Do I sit in tome and basically do nothing? Like, I can do some heals and stuff, but they're not for that much, and they are skill shots, so they might, they have a good chance of missing your allies. What, what most of the uh, more effective teams were doing is just once they use those two skills, jumping out of Tome and then getting back into the fight and doing other CCs and things mm. like that. So it does give you the invincibility. It's a great, as you saw, anchor skill, uh, especially against multiple opponents. So, you know, in that respect, it is extremely good, but it does have some significant drawbacks in that you're not, you know, you can sit there for 20 seconds, but you won't really be doing anything once you use those, those two skills. Interesting. So, any other uh, thought? I mean, the the one that I had heard was that guardians that stack uh, healing that really really stacks super well with their passive regeneration. Uh, I think it's called uh, virtue of justice. No, courage. No, that's uh, resolve. There we go. Resolve. The last one I, I mouse <laughs> over. Uh, resolve is the regenerate health. Somebody said that it uh, stacks twelve percent of your healing bonus into that regeneration per tick. And that seems like a pretty large number. And I think that's that's another reason that people were saying that's a different, maybe a different Guardian build, or maybe that's the same one that I'm talking about. Do you guys uh, familiar with that one from the weekend? Um, I stacked healing for my first Guardian build. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, regen is something that I never actually noticed. Um, pretty much it's not very good as a, as a, as a boon in itself. Um, it heals pretty low. I, I guess mm. Signet Resolve might do something, but really it's more of just, I just use it for a quick team heal, just hit the F2 key and heal your whole party really quickly for like 1k to 2k health. Um, but outside of that, the regen in itself, it doesn't remove enough damage from the input you're going to take in, especially with everyone focusing you, um, which is why it's nice to have Sanctuary, but even then, Sanctuary still has its own bugs. Hara mentioned one. Pretty much you can auto attack at the very edge of it with like a great sword or hammer. So you just sit there and people don't want to leave the bubble because it's a bubble and they feel safe inside of it and they just die instead, right? But um, also, you can use a stability skill and walk right into the bubble and then just go up face oh, to face with the guy. Oh, that's kind of um, an interesting counter. I like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's intentional or not, because it, but it bypasses the whole knockback function of it. Yeah. And then apparently Sanctuary, I, I didn't test it myself, but uh, Kuro did, but Sanctuary knocks at you out of tomb root placement also, and I didn't know that. But. It knocks out of root placement. So if some, if another guardian has been using like a tome or or an elementalist had been conjuring or something like that, uh, a channeled skill, the bubble yeah. would knock them out and interrupt what they were doing, basically. Yeah. Ah, interesting. Okay. Uh, so any any further discussion on guardian? Did we miss anything? Um. Oh. Jacob. Yeah. Jacob can talk about it, but a more damage oriented guardian. So go ahead. Yeah, I think we. Oh, there's a lot to talk about with that class. I mean, uh, a lot of the thing about stacking the healing power for the regen that that can be, you know, give you some sustain. Um, I didn't see anything anywhere near getting, you know, near thousand ticks on yourself. I don't think you could get anywhere near that high, but you could probably get to around two or three hundred, which would still be quite a lot. But you got to remember the healing power that's coming at the cost of other stats particularly vitality um, and power and things like that, because uh, some mistakes that some Guardians were making is that a lot of them were going for primarily a really strong support build. They're using Consecrations, which have uh, very long casting times and uh, cooldowns, and they're going for a very support-oriented build and trying to do the walls and the blocking skills and that kind of thing, where what they should have been doing is going with the shouts because the 30 trade point with shouts means every time you use a shout, you're turning a condition from everyone on your team into a boons and you can basically chain the three shouts. So you're giving your team all kinds of buffs and condition removal while at the same time, you're not stuck in any kind of casting times or anything. 
So you can just run around and do whatever you want in terms of, uh, you know, damage and CC. So the one-handed sword was actually capable of very impressive damage output, even though you weren't building too much into damage, because it's very effective due to the uh, gap closing skill number two, which is the blink that blinds, the three skill, which is a burst skill also on a pretty low cooldown, and that guarantees burn. So the, uh, the sword is actually quite good as a uh, burn spanning weapon because the the one uh, virtue they have is a burn every five attacks so you can just spam damage the burst skill the the uh, gap closer and the burn and you're actually quite effective one versus one and, and against softies and that kind of thing and with the shouts you're still able to protect your team without being hampered by long uh, casting times or long cooldowns so you're just constantly helping your team constantly putting out damage and uh, a CC and that kind of thing. So you can actually be very, very effective in terms of helping your team kill people while at the same same time doing support. Whereas if you're going with the uh, consecrations and that kind of thing, you know, I think s casting uh, stuff that requires your teammates to stand in it, it's a long, long casting times and that is just, it's so hard, it's not as effective honestly because you could be actually doing quite a bit of damage and usually doing damage and CCing the other team is a lot more effective than simply standing around and trying to support your own team. All right. Uh, very, very cool. I, like I said, I love learning about all the different uh, builds that you can have with these other classes. Um, let, let's, uh, before we close out the show, let's talk a little bit about team comp. Did you guys find there was one role that you needed to m make sure that you have to have, like support role or tank role or spike role? Like, was there one thing that we can't go into a tournament without this? Um, I didn't really find it to be role based, but rather just what can, like, I think there's four things you have to have in your team, no matter what, which is a uh, group speed boost. And you want two of them, so you can get the full speed boost if you're going to invade. Hmm. Um, condition removal by default. Uh, stability, because what actually got us killed was that we couldn't ever finish people. And we, they just, we get CC'd out and they rally. And that really screwed us over because we were pretty much fighting the same people multiple times and not getting the points for ah. it. And just overall CC. Um, I think our philosophy started becoming more aggressive and the ability to fight the NPC solo. It doesn't matter what class you have, just being able to kill it. Um, because you want to be able to dictate the terms of which you're going to fight the most important thing in the game, rather than having to wait for an ally or whatever and giving the enemy team to respond. You want to just do it yourself. Um, and then um, I guess I'll just mention this as well before I turn it over to someone else. Um, in terms of team comps, people think overall warriors are really, really good. But the best team in Beta Weekend Event 2 didn't run a single warrior. They actually ran Elementalist, Guardian, Engineer, Mesmer, Necro. Um, so I think in terms of having specific classes, it doesn't matter. But rather, like you're saying, roles of just speed boosting or stability, CC, or condition removal is far more important. Okay. A any uh, final thoughts then uh, from, from anybody in the group here before we, we log off? Structured PvP from Beta Weekend number 2. Any final thoughts? It was fun. Yeah, fun. fun. Yeah, it felt really good to play. Um, I I've played a lot of MMOs, and I I think out of all of all of the hotkey combat I've played, Guild Wars Two is by far the most fluid. It's the most uh, immersive as as far as like actually being able to move around. It feels very actiony, and it's something that I really enjoyed. Awesome. I, I kind of felt the same way for the little, you know, I, I, on Saturday, I think, for about four or five hours I spent in uh, structured PvP. We played a couple of tournaments and lost horribly because we weren't, <laughs> we were just derping around in it. But it was, uh, it was definitely a lot of fun. And like you said, it felt like you had to be more on the ball, like everything was more real time than in other MMOs. You had to be constantly concentrating on what you were going to do next, when you were going to dodge around a corner to block a skill, pop a, you know, and immobilize the right moment so that they run into your AoE, etc., etc. Those, those kinds of decisions happening in real time, split second, it felt more like, like, you, like, like TF2 or, or a MOBA. It, 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 it's really, oh, I, I can't wait to get back into it. Well, I'm and, so happy. And... Just to add to that, even it's, it even goes beyond that because you know think about it before before Guild Wars two basically every MMO is uh, you know it's the hot bar press one two three you know this where your movement is very effective you know when I hit the block skill I'm hitting block I'm not like this is X percentage of block or that kind of thing you know I've always been wanting to play an MMO which had more you know Devil May Cry or Zelda Ocarina of Time like that style of combat mm -hmm. and, and Guild Wars two is very close to that in a lot of ways and, and it, it, you know it's a totally new 
mechanic for PvP game that we haven't seen in any other, you know, WoW style type of game. It's just totally new in the RPG scene. And, uh, you know, I'm really happy to see where it's going to go. Absolutely. Oh, man. So cool. All right. With that, I think we are going to call it a night. Thanks, you guys, for joining me. Let's have a, a, a good welcome here for Team Legacy Division 1A. Actellum, thank you for getting these guys together for me here. This was a, a really successful show, I think. And obviously, we'd like to thank everybody else in D1A for, uh, for, for sticking up for Team Legacy. I know not everybody from D1A managed to get on here. There's about 10 people or so in there. So just wanted to say thanks, guys, and uh, very important, deal with it. upset. Why doesn't he like this photo? <laughs> he doesn't like it because he has man boobs. <laughs> Which one is Crow in this picture? He's, he's the pasty guy on the left. <laughs> the one the with the standing in a really awkward... The one photoshopped yeah. him. <laughs> oh, you photoshopped him into this? Is that why he's standing so weird? Everybody no, it else? looks that way, doesn't it? It does look like that. <laughs> I like the elementalist just sitting down like, I could be doing something better than this. God, he's not even looking at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, you have to have the giant Norn in the background, like, Arnold just, like, flexing. Look at the muscles. Oh, man, that's an awesome picture. <laughs> I can't that get is. over that. So many poses. It is on, the man. Hulk. I love the dog, yeah, too. Man. The, <laughs> the Norn, Hulk. man. Nobody likes the Norn, but I, I don't know, man. He's, he's pretty beefy. <laughs> yeah. The burliest of all. The burliest of all. Now... Let's ask you guys, because we were speculating on this for a long time during the, during the actual show's run. Uh, are you guys going to all run a Sura so that they can't target you? <laughs> nah. I will be. No, I'm probably going to run Norn. I'm going to stick with Norn, probably. That's right. You better <laughs> see where I am. Deal with it. <laughs> can you wear aviator sunglasses in structured you, PvP? You, you no. can. You, you, you can. have to spam it. Yeah, but uh, spam yeah, yeah. the power. That's a though. I mean, you no, can't really. You don't well, well it like the first, the for the town. first half of Friday, I was doing it, but I didn't realize I lost all my runes bonuses from it. But that's that's besides the point. <laughs> it's still oh, amazing. No. I got some no. footage of you running by me naked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a funny thing with the way you can transmute stuff. Like I I don't think you can transmute clothing onto gear, and you can't trans cross transmute PVE and PVP stuff. Like I was messing around with the transmutation stones, and I couldn't do anything that I wanted to do, and it made me really sad. That makes sense. That makes sense. All right, guys, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to clean up my green screen here, and then, uh, <laughs> then, then get to maybe some league or something. I think Eyedrops is sitting in the wings there. So, all right. Thanks, guys, for watching. And uh, hey, finals. Thanks, for, thanks for joining me, guys. It was, uh, that, was, that was very eye-opening and very cool to hear from you guys. Thank you. Awesome, me. man. Well, yeah, I mean... Uh, you know, it was awesome to be on the show. Uh, you know, I've been, like I said, I've been a fan for a while, and uh, you know, anytime. You know, I'll be on anytime. All right, cutting down.